Hi, I'm Laura. Thanks for making up this morning after I know it's a party last night. It's very impressive to see a full room. <laughs> um, so let's start. So today I'm here to talk about some personal experience about how me and my agency uh, do agile at the agency with some of our clients who are actually returning clients and what I want to share with you today is a few case studies so pretty much hand on uh, presentation for me I'm happy to take any questions any moment uh, during the presentation or at the end um, if you come up with questions or want to contact me later the first one is my Twitter account and the second one is the company Twitter account so I'm on both um, I guess um, I picked three main case studies. Is this thing working? Yeah. Yeah, yeah cool. Um, uh, because I've been with the company for three years. Uh, I've been doing Agile with them for three years. My digital skills go way back in the past. But um, I was lucky enough for the past three years to actually monitor how we do Agile and just identify some of the patterns that actually we bring across the project and across the clients, which help us delivering um, projects successfully and having returning clients, which for me as a project manager is pretty awesome. Um, so before talking about the presentation, about, a bit about me and the agency as well, so the funny accent is because I'm Italian. Um, <laughs> just shout if you don't understand. Um, I've been working nine years in the uh, digital environment, so I started from entertainment. I went to, to work for uh, all finance and then took an extreme step back and went to work for first sector because that is where my passion is. was lucky enough to work on the London Paralympics uh, website as well, so that is where I learned to work with remote teams as well, different parties, big complex field. Uh, currently, I work uh, with mainly open source technologies in the publishing sector. Uh, this is the agency I work for, so we are a small to medium agency in London, um, really keen on open source, I think it's amazing, the community in London is very active and passionate, and um, I think we learn a lot from being um, working in the communities with open source so it's full of very passionate people very friendly willing to share and uh, this is some of the values that we have brought back to the agency as well which are fundamental in my opinion to run successfully agile and to keep the engagement of both the team and the clients up um, at all times um, what we do is basically uh, mainly the service is a building website and app but with the time we are expanding so not only technical we are going into ux coaching uh, myself i got to um, deliver agile training to um, customers as well um, so i guess I was quite new to Agile when I joined my agency and I think possibly it's also a barrier of the language but I don't like labels so uh, when I was trying to understand Agile, what makes Agile successful, uh, how everybody um, uh, works within the Agile framework, I was trying to um, relay the principles to everyday life. And I think Agile is pretty much everywhere, so it's about collaboration, it's about communication, it's about having a very good um, relation with uh, your teammates and your clients. Um, one very classic example I think for me is porn, so I can see like Agile everywhere, um, in cycling as well in motorcycling, whatever, you pick the one you want, I can see this in politics, I can see this in the kitchen when you're trying to make your best getting ever. But, um, so what, what do they do that relates to us? For me, 
I watch a lot of the MotoGP and I relate to them. So what I do is every two weeks they go out, they run a race, um, they learn from the race, they go back, they try again, they have uh, two weeks to get ready, they have a bit of preparation to the next race, and then they improve. And that relates to our agile actually, because we have two experiences. We go, we work hard, we refine, we get ready for deployment, and we release. We learn and we improve. So I try to apply this kind of principle to the way we work, the way I communicate to the clients as well. So that breaks down basically. And my job as a project manager became more and more not like a control freak, but a facilitator. So I facilitate mainly these two principles of the Agile Manifesto. So um, my job stopped being actually just about documentation, perfection, and like controlling everything, everything, and everybody, every step of the way. It was more about making it easy, making an enjoyable environment and helping people to actually appreciate each other and collaborate better. And I think that is the very, very key of what we do with our clients as well. So, individuals are the center of our jobs. So, I think the success is from the start, from the first meeting with the client, from the moment your client walks into your office, you make him feel welcome, and you try to understand what are the things that can work together very well, and what are the things that you maybe need to work on a little bit more. So I am fortunate enough to work in an agency where uh, we are professional but friendly, we just encourage great communication, and we are very, very transparent. I thought before joining Agile that um, sharing documentation I was transparent with my clients, but actually what Agile allows you to do is every step by step being honest, be visible, being very um, collaborative as well. So for me the point of like creating the cultural environment when you work together, when your client wants to pop in your office and you want to go to your client. The face-to-face -face commitment of Agile is really helping a lot. So what I really care about is that it's friendly. So a lot of a lot of time we um, we just want to be professional, we want to be awesome, we want to be like, oh we are just like <coughs> such experts and we forgot about the human base. So for me what makes the clients return to us as well, what they, they trust us is because, sorry, I got stuck. Um, we do want to work with you. We are professional, we are passionate, but we are friendly um, as well. So um, creating that environment in your office is absolutely essential um, to keep the relationship up and you do that through communication and through transparency. So, just a couple of things before I go to the case studies. Um, we went through a bit of restructure in the agency in the way we communicate with the clients. So, as a project manager, I'm a facilitator, but also I think I'm the shield of the dev team. So. I, when I joined the company, there was a lot of communication everywhere because now we have so many means. So you have Skype, you have your chat rooms, your emails, you have the phone. And I noticed the guys were quite frustrated because there are too many conversations to follow up, too many information shared in too many places. So without revolutionizing anything, we just put some basic rules to how we communicate internally and how we communicate with the clients. So, these are just some examples of the tools we use. So, it's uh, Skype, we have Hangouts, 
we have hip chat, which is a chat room. Um, what we did was setting ourselves rules. So we do want to communicate transparently with the clients. So the chat rooms are not only internal. And I think that is the core of our communication with the clients. Uh, we share the chat room with the clients. If there is only one chat room per project. The clients, the internal team, the tester, me as PM, or the dev team is in there. So the communication is encouraged to use just the agile ceremonies. So we have the daily stand-ups, we have the weekly grooming, and we have the planning. Um, one big lesson we learn and we make sure we pass on to the client is <coughs> use those daily meetings to communicate properly. Outside those daily meetings, it's just purely emergency. That is because you want to pay, as an agency, to do the work, not to be interrupted all times um, by communication. When I first joined the company, my first project, I basically had a hot fix request every other day. Uh, there was a lot of communication in the chat rooms. Hot fix for, for a project manager is just because there is no manager internally of the requests. Everything that the business was asking was coming straight into the chat room. So we put a stop at it. We said, okay, just actually consider what you write in the chat room. So everything there is in the chat room is just basically touching base or like extra help for the testers and developers. If it's not um, an emergency, the website is done, um, it can wait the stand up the day after. Because we do use the stand up in an informative way. So everybody is saying what they're working on. So if the plan is still fine, if the website is not down, we carry on the information and the communication is very minimal. If a tester needs help, he can say to the chat room, oh actually, can you take a look at this because I'm a, I don't know how to test this user story. Um, um, the advantage of the approach is we don't have the middlemen anymore. So the chat room is basically open to everybody. Everybody knows what's going on. But there is very little interruption during the work day for the dev team. So by using the um, stand-ups and the streamlining communication, we actually help the productivity of the team as well, who had much less interruptions during the day. Biggest lesson for me throughout was how to be assertive without sounding too strong, too bold to the clients. I often had problems differentiating um, being rude and in your face with assertive. <laughs> so, um, actually, I think it's just about a confidence. The first few times it feels really difficult and really hard to say to the clients, oh, you can't do that. Um, the example I've got here is actually about uh, processes. We have a workflow, we have a schedule during the Agile Sprint where we do run backlog grooming. So a lot of time our groomings were turning into a mess of a conversation where we actually couldn't define or estimate <coughs> much user stories because the conversation were going all over the place and the client didn't do any work bef between the previous grooming session and the actual current grooming session. So I think I spoke to the client a few times and said, look, this is about your interest and my interest, so let's have some refinements of how we prepare for and how we run the grooming sessions. So we just tweak a little bit the agile workflow that we had. So the client was requested to write in user stories 
and do the prioritization ahead of the brewing because that helps with the product owner knows exactly what he wants to achieve through the massive backlog. So prioritize the stories at the top. Uh, that allows him and the team to actually get and ask questions to all the relevant teams in the business. If there are uncertainties, if we don't know who needs to be involved for the user stories or we don't know how to write the acceptance criteria. So all the pre-preparation, it was something that we didn't have initially in the project and now it's very common, especially when we have distributed teams. Uh, some teams are in India, some in America, some in the UK. So getting to speak to each other, you can't do it in a two to three hours grooming session. It needs to be a continuous conversation. So we did put some rules and it did help a lot in making our meetings shorter and more efficient. So um, this on the slide is just some of the um, rules that we agreed with the client and we really help us grow out. I can go back later if you want to ask any questions to how we do it. Um, another thing we do, and we started to do it, I think it was about two years ago. We all know Agile, we all assume Agile as some principles, we assume we know what a Scrum Master does or what a product owner does, but the reality is Every company is different, bigger scales, more scale. You work with a core project team that could be two people, it could be five people, it could be seven to ten. You need to know who your stakeholders are, you need to know who needs to be where and what. You need to know who to go to, to get the knowledge you need to create good user stories to create good growth station, to create an MVP that actually meets the business requirements. So this little spreadsheet we've got here is part of the project document. We have one project document per client. All the information is in there, in terms. There is no crazy amount of documentation. Um, the project document is something that I use at the beginning of each project. And he helped me, helps me to get to know the team. And actually, it helps the client a lot to define their own team. We all work in a room with a lot of assumptions. We think that the senior member of the client size is the product owner and it's got access to people and those people have the knowledge, but those are all assumptions. So when I go here, my kickoff meeting actually is to present my team, to present myself, to present assumption of what I do on the project. That gives the idea to the client straight away, yes, this is the service I want from you, or actually, I expected more, I expected less, you know. It could tell me, I've got a project manager on my side, so I don't want you on my project, so why are you bring it to my project? And this is where the discussion starts. It's very, very useful to expect expectations. Um, those information, how you spend your time, is clarified at the beginning. And it's going to be also a help to the client to understand the budget and your cost to the project, which I'll go to later on. Uh, we do the same thing on client side, because we are pretty pretty technical, um, so we want to understand where is the knowledge when I start working with the client. So if the knowledge doesn't sit in the room, why they don't sit in the room? Or when do they need to sit in the room? So we don't have the expectations with Agile to take all the time from everybody. People are busy, people are too important or whatever. So at the beginning, we do run through everybody, every stakeholder that needs to be involved in the project as well, at what stage and how. And this helps us to actually define our risks as well. One of the main risks for us is access to people, timely access to people. By doing this exercise, you exactly know who you need to go to, 
and speak to or involve, keep in the loop with your reports, with your demos at the right time. It's a very good exercise. Um, I tend to speak about Agile just when I think about code and software, but actually it's not. For a project manager, I think we are also getting Agile. So the exercise I'll just show you, I just don't do it at a kickoff meeting. A lot of time the projects go on for a year or two or six months or all of a sudden the product owner decides it's got enough and it's going to go for a trip to the, I don't know, to Cuba or something. The team changes, the dynamic changes, everything changes. One tiny um, change could have repercussion on how you work. So if you have a new person who's less technical, who doesn't know your project, who doesn't know how to speak to his stakeholders, how does that impact your team? So we went in for, uh, I think it's from the Telegraph, a uh, media group, very dynamic team. They have lots of projects and the team changes a lot. Um, at the beginning, we, had, uh, we went through the exercise and the product owner took on so much responsibilities that we were like, there's no way you can actually keep up with doing this. And it was adamant that it was, so we started the project. And after two or three sprints, we went back in and said, actually, look, um, this kind of doesn't work because we are starting to get information back from you. You're clearly too busy. What can we do? We realign the team. We help him delegate work to other people. So I think one of the roles I've learned to do is also helping the clients. So um, you become their support. You find solutions for them also from um, the project management point of view. It's not only about development. It's also about the interaction you've got with the team and with the individuals. So this is about individuals and you'll be greatly, greatly appreciated if you observe, if you monitor, if you help them deliver. So I think that is the big message here. Um, so as I said before, one of the practices, I guess, is that uh, um, recognizes ourselves as if in individuals we are professional. I think I'm very lucky to work in an industry where most of the people are passionate about what they're doing. But we are individual as well. So I think going back to be assertive before, it does help. When you do something, you have a structure that you know it works, um, you know how to run the stand ups, you know how to run, you know, grooming meetings. Uh, Sometimes I have to cut off conversations. At the beginning, it was really, really difficult. The guys, my, the dev team, didn't understand why. And they were a bit upset because they had to talk about techie stuff to understand how to write a user story or the implementation. So I explained to them what we are we doing grooming is the requirements. We write some of the acceptance criteria, the dev notes, the development uh, conversations were cut off during grooming because I could observe around the room and half of my core project team was falling asleep because they did not care about technical implementation. But so once we reached the agreement and a high level understanding of how the dev would approach the user story. I would cut off the conversations. Um, some people appreciated it straight away because you actually get more done in less time. Some people struggle because they thought outside the grooming meeting they couldn't talk about it anymore, which is not the case. So they could, once we speak to the team, I spoke to the team afterwards, I said, look, so now you can go off and talk to the lead developers talk to, um, to know, web ops, wherever, uh, client side, and get a better understanding of how you're going to implement it. So the conversation carried on outside with using less time and less people. So I think the focus here is about 
be assertive, but also be aware of the people in your room. I always observe the room, how people react, if they are awake, if they are interested, if they are on mobile phones or not. So the moment I see smoothing out distractions, probably the conversation went too long. I cut it back short. So bring people back to be engaged with you. If they're not engaged, try to understand why. And then either carry on or move on. And you tackle it accordingly. Um, another big, big um, advantage that we got with Agile is actually retrospectives. Love retrospectives. Um, at the beginning, we just want to retrospect in the usual way. So um, we went out of the room, everybody was sharing, almost everybody was sharing what went well, what didn't go so well, and um, we had a nice conversation. Uh, maybe at the beginning you have to encourage people, then they just do it because they want to let it off. Big mistake was we didn't review the previous points we talked in previous retrospectives. So it's nice to talk about things, but then if you don't do anything about it, we don't improve. So what we started to do as I take notes during the retrospective, we have mitigation points for all the action that people feel frustrated about or feel they don't work very well. In the next retrospective, we review and we say, did we tackle it? Did it go better? If we didn't tackle it, is it still happening? Do we need to do something about it? And that made a very, very big impact in the way we work internally and we work with the client as well. So actually, you see minimal but constant improvements in the relationship as well. Clients loved it and you give them an opportunity to open up. It's usually not about individual self to say, so it's not pointing the fingers to blah blah blah, didn't do this and so I had a crappy week or something. It's about processes, it's about a challenge, it's about particular user stories or particular um, event that happened during the spring. Um, I guess I covered this one um, somehow already. So I think with big clients, the challenge is you have big teams. You have big teams everywhere in the world. We have this kind of site publication. There are different branches across the globe. So they're in Australia, they're in India, in the US. And what I talk about so far is about me being able to understand those people who sit in the room. So um, we identified some problems in the way we were running Agile, and some problems with the communication within the teams. There are cultural barriers, there are different ways to approach work from different part of, part of the world as well. So the moment the team changes, we enlarge and outsource testing to India. So we took a lot of assumptions about, oh, they are outsourced, they are from such publications, so they know what they're doing. Wrong. So for me the lesson is, don't take assumptions. It takes probably <coughs> one hour of training or workshop to just go through how we were, what the expectations are. So again, I took out my horrible spreadsheet and went to <laughs> through team roles and responsibilities. So now we are outsourcing, we have our own new relationship. How does it work? Who is gonna manage the testing? How is the feedback coming back? And all those kind of things. Very, very useful. Um, another thing is the workflow. Some of you are gonna scream in our room now. This is how the workflow, workflow for us developed on complex projects. So we don't have anymore just how to do in progress and done. We had to adapt to the client, to make it easy for the client to have the visualization of where their work is, in what stage it is, how we gonna accomplish our sprint goals or not. Because the team is so separated throughout the world, if you leave everything under an in-progress column and three teams are working, 
under the in-progress code is going to get messy real soon. So we wrote this one to just make it easier to all the team to understand how the dev work, where it works, when, when does it merge, is cool, when is the user story ready for the tester. We had instances where the testers were all over the place, they were trying to test on staging, but the code was only merging testing, so we had feedback that wasn't relevant, there was a bottom mess on the board. Also, there is so much repetition you can do, so I do some agile coaching at the beginning of all my projects. People receive information in a different way. We coach the team twice. We still had issues about the workflow, because they couldn't understand. So, it might sound patronizing, but what I ended up doing was actually define the priorities of the columns and how we work, what the expectations are, where are the responsibility of moving the user stories from one column to the other. I asked the new team members to print this out, get it up. And after running two workshops of three hours, we still had issues. After printing a simple A4 paper, we run smooth because they had a constant reminder there. So I think, I know it's quite spoon feeding, but was the Albert Einstein inside in sunny days trying to do the same thing all over again and try and expect different results? So obviously the verbal communication was in the way, we try a different approach, whatever works. Um, Friendly. I love friendly. I love being in meetings where people are relaxed enough to make a joke. It makes it easier if there is an issue, you know. They know they can rely on you, but they can laugh. We can laugh together, we can find a solution together. There's, not, there's no need of tragedy. So creating the environment I was talking about before is possible. Retrospective help a lot and sharing helps a lot. Being genuine, if you are frustrated, just say it. It's normal. Human beings, we're individual. That's what our job is about. Don't hide. So what I keep saying to the guys as well, like if we share, we can do something about it. If you just like sit in the corner and grow frustration, we don't go anywhere. And I think we learn how to do this with the clients as well. It's amazing. You do it. They do it, slowly, slowly. It's not overnight, but they do it. So that kind of relationship help opens up a lot. And they'll be honest with you. If they see something that they don't like, they don't want to change, they will tell you, and you can adapt. So it's not always easy. It's hard sometimes to admit mistakes, but if you do, the client will trust you immensely because you don't only share the good things, you also share things. Um, I might be running. I'll, try. I'll go through this quickly, but transparency. So we we share everything. We share everything with the clients. They're on our chat rooms. They all have, uh, have access to our project management tool. They also use the stories, comments, conversations between me and developers. They see every single line of reporting. I do, and they do love it. So, what I do for them is I share how we spend the time. Uh, never, nobody likes time logs, a lot of us have to do it anyway. So, we build time and material, and this is how we show them how we spend our money. We have sprint reports with uh, user stories, and we add not so granular, I guess, but it's good enough for them. We divide the budget reports to what the dev used, what the tester used, what the PMBA used. We do this following Agile. I do the report sprintly, I do the invoicing sprintly. That helps them say, this is all I've achieved this spring, and this is what it cost me. This helped me 
to identify issues with the team or with the workflow. Most of the time, my time on a project is about 10-15%. I get clients with peak times of 40% of project management time. This kind of reporting helped me a lot to actually visualize those issues. So I go to the clients like, guys, I spent 40%. This is very unusual. Like, what is going on? Those brings days, bad news or good news. So, um, bad news because obviously you don't want to spend 40% on a project manager. Um, it's good news because you can see it, you can tackle it. You don't need to get to the end of the project and then an incredible overhead. What did I touch? Um, on, your, on your project. Very good for retrospective. So, if I see a spike in the usage of the time, we can talk about it. We can just like talk about what happened in the team, what happened to the client side, and say, okay, how can I help the client not to use 40% of my time? Good for me, because I can go off and do something more exciting, and good for them, because they save money. Um, another, this is all part of the same document, but we also do forecasting. So our backlogs are full a day. It includes all the scope of the project, I estimated um, high level estimates at the beginning, but that helps me to actually assess um, the user story points I've got in the backlog against the budget I've got left. So I can give quite an accurate forecast to the clients by doing my reporting at the end of every spring. I can actually foresee closing off, if we can deliver everything, we agreed for the MVP, if we can't de deliver everything for the MVP, because some of the functionality was more complex, because um, someone decided to change the scope or the priorities. It's a fantastic way of relating to the client, because you can start talking about how you use the remaining budget way in advance. It's a bit waterfully, but it actually really helped. So I think the biggest lesson here in terms of how we achieve the trust and the relationship with the client was we know what we do well. <coughs> we do very good code, we have some quality, we know how to do agile. We are very keen to maintain some of those agile practices because obviously they help, but we are flexible. I never sit in a room and say, this is agile, this is how it works, and this is how we're gonna run this project for the next six months. I sit in the room, I observe, I learn, I interact, and I'm flexible. So I experiment. So during the retrospectives, we uh, talk about stuff that didn't go well, we adjust, we experiment. Sometimes we fail, sometimes it's an improvement that's gonna stay with us at the end of the project. So I think for me the biggest lesson is how are so clients coming back to us is understand them as individuals, be receptive, um, observe them, keep an open mind. We are good at our stuff, we know what we're doing, but also we need to understand other circumstances. And I think that's about it. Yeah, that's about it. <laughs>